the woman who has the belly fat and is absolutely frustrated because she does work out two hours a day and it won't budge is generally the woman that has erratic or flattened cortisol profiles. And the remedy there is got to dial back on that intense exercise. I can't tell you how many women I've talked to that are over exercising. We know that marathon runners and Olympic athletes are famous for having anovulatory cycles where they don't ovulate. So again, back to that lack of progesterone, no food for the adrenals to make cortisol. We got to dial back on the intense exercise. Welcome back to the Essentially You podcast, all about reinventing your health with safer, cheaper, more effective natural solutions and powerful lifestyle changes so that you become the CEO of your health. I am your host, Dr. Marisa Snyder. Today, we are diving into a topic that you have been asking me about for quite some time. And I have a very special guest, Candace Birch, who is going to help me shed some light on the area of what happens when our hormones are in transition in perimenopause and beyond. We are specifically discussing how to identify hormonal imbalances during perimenopause and beyond. Because as you can imagine, this is a very big topic. This is specifically what we're going to be handling today. Now, as I discussed in my new book, The Essential Oils Hormone Solution, perimenopause can start as early as 35 years old or starts 10 years before menopause, depending on who you ask. Now, if you were to ask me, I will tell you that I remember being 35 and feeling my body transition, felt like my hormones transition and having to make some changes based on that. When I talked to my mom about when she really began to feel those changes as well, it was also 35 for her. Now, in this time of perimenopause, which can feel very much like hormone limbo, well, what's happening was that we are having a slow decline of our ovaries as a big player in the endocrine system. Now, this accompanies by a very slow decline of fertility, which really speeds up into our 40s. But what is going on in perimenopause? Well, that's exactly what we're going to tackle today in this conversation. You may have guessed that how you feel during perimenopause has a lot more to do with just age. And that's good news because that means we can do a lot about it. We have have so much control and so much power over the way that our bodies function. And that's kind of what we're going to be touching upon. What are some of our options as we step into this transition? Now, before we get into this much needed conversation about how to identify these changes in our body, I just wanted to make sure that you had a chance to hear my amazing news in case you missed Friday's episode with Dr. Marisol. Now, as you know, my newest book, number seven, book number seven, released three weeks ago today, which is just, oh my gosh, it's been the most incredible, amazing three weeks. I just got back from a six city book tour and I'm about to take off literally this afternoon for the next part of that book tour, I'm heading off to Atlanta and some other cities. So I'm so excited. This has just been the greatest whirlwind. And let me tell you, when I began to really share this book in a big way last fall, I honestly had no idea how life-changing it was going to be for so many people. But every day in my inbox, in my Instagram direct messages, in my Facebook messages, literally they are filled with testimonials and just, just amazing feedback about the book from women. And here, I just wanted to quickly share with you a couple of testimonials that we've received on Amazon. So right now, the book has over 255 reviews on Amazon. Most of them are five-star reviews. And I just can't tell you, like, I never dreamed that we'd have that many reviews so quickly. But my gosh, this book is really catching on fire. So here's just two of them I wanted to share with you to get a sense of what women are thinking about or what women are feeling now that they've gotten into the book. Here's the first review. My book arrived last night and I can't put it down. Written by someone who has experienced fatigue, overdrive, stress, and hormonal imbalance, her book is an easy read complete with self-help tips which are manageable. The Essential Oils Hormone Solution provides answers to questions women have struggled with for ages. Every woman should have it for themselves, their daughters, and their mother. The next one is, here it is. I'm just going to read it for you. I ordered this book from Amazon and got it here today. I love it. Already read it, skimmed it cover to cover. 
so much information. I will go back and read each chapter again more slowly. I will be rereading this book for a long time to come. There are so many hormonal scenarios covered with possible solutions listed for each. It is interesting to read about the author's personal experiences and how she studied all the ways to find a solution to her own hormone issues. Whether you're 20 or menopausal, you will find this excellent research on hormone issues with recipes to help you on your quest to feel better. So many exciting recipes. A lot of this book focuses on essential oils and there's tons of recipes using oils, but there's also food and recipes to just assist in amazing living. I'm gonna be getting another copy of this book for my daughter. Well, and let me tell you, just being able to read those, if you decide that you wanna write a review on Amazon, I want you to know that I honor that so much. I have been reading all the reviews on Amazon. They're coming in every day. And I always want, you know, if indeed you choose to write a review, I always want you to know that I'm gonna honor your time and honor your effort by reading it. You know, Amazon reviews are just everything for an author because they literally help to continue to get the book out in a big way. And you should know that my commitment for getting this book out in a big way is so massive mainly because of the lives that the book has already helped, you know, already. And I'm thinking, well, gosh, if I could help 25,000 women, like how many more women can I help? So if you're wondering why I share it so much on the podcast, not only was it my heart and soul put into this, but also I know that it's such an incredible resource to get into the hands of so many women out there who really feel lost on this hormone journey. Now back to the epic news, because in case you didn't hear episode on Friday, I think that was episode 69. I wanted to just give you the epic news real quick on this episode, which is episode number 70. The Essential Oils Hormone Solution hit the number one best-selling book in the nation in, in terms of health and wellness. So it was the number one best-selling book in health and wellness in all of the nation. It was number eight on Wall Street Journal's top 10 books in the nation right there with Michelle Obama, Rachel Hollis, and Joanne Gaines. It hit the top 10 in the Publishers Weekly. It hit number one in USA Health Today for health books. And it was the third best-selling book that week when it hit the bookshelves. So I just wanna say, I just don't even have words for for that. And how, you know, we've it's been such a whirlwind and there have been moments where I'm like, I just need to take that in and really enjoy it and really celebrate it. But I've just been trying to get it out there. And I, honestly, we really haven't done that yet. But I just want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for grabbing a copy and sharing it with someone that you love. Thank you for posting about the book on social media. And thank you for writing that Amazon review. This book is really about a revolution in women's health. And a revolution really starts with a word of like word of mouth. That's how we share everything and anything. Is And when something creates that kind of power, it's usually through word of mouth. So... Thank you so much for spreading it word of mouth far and wide. I can't tell you what that means to me. I've seen it in multiple countries. And you know, the thing of it is, is that each and every one of us deserves to understand our bodies and make educated choices based on that information. We deserve that to have our symptoms validated and we deserve a healthcare plan that addresses our entire body, not just one or two symptoms. That is what this book is. So, and I apologize. I've been on a book tour. My voice is so raspy because I've been speaking to so many women and the stories have been so powerful and so heartbreaking, you know, to hear women's accounts of how they've been treated in the medical system or how they've been dismissed. And I want you to know that I'm, I want to be an advocate for, for you and for any woman who's ever not been treated right, has been ignored and dismissed because I know I've been there. I've been there more than once. And um, and, and today is the day that we change that. We change the conversation. We rewrite the story. We, we create a different path for women. And that's why I'm having this interview today. So let's jump on into this amazing interview with Candace Birch. But before I do this, I do want to sing her praises. So Candace Birch is a hormone health educator, a founder of Your Hormone Balance, a hormone testing and consulting practice that helps people of all ages detect and correct hormonal imbalances that negatively impact their health and longevity. She received her master's in health education in 79 and has worked with Medical Publishing in the UK has been the Director of Education at ZRT Hormone Testing Lab. Um, Candice is a co-founder of Women in Balance, an educational nonprofit. Her mission as a wellness advocate is to educate, inspire, and guide women towards safe, natural approaches to hormone balance and breast cancer prevention.
Welcome to the Essentially You podcast, Candice Birch. I am so, oh my goodness, let me tell you, I have been Instagram stalking you a little bit and I am so excited for the expertise and wisdom that you are bringing to this episode today. Thank you for having me. I'm so grateful. Well, we are going to be talking all things hormones, which let me tell you, it is my favorite topic. I know it's your favorite topic. And my readers and and listeners love this topic mainly because there are a lot of women out there, as we both know, struggling with hormone issues. But before we get into the meat of this conversation, because I have a lot of questions to ask you, I kind of want to know, you know, I have a story around why I do this work. I know you have a story for why you do this work. And I would just love to hear a little bit about your journey into women's hormone health. Okay, sure. I had in my 30s done a lot of traveling with my husband. We kind of left the States and went over to England and I had my children over there and was working as, uh, I have a master's in health education and I was working in, in medical and health publishing in the UK and being kind of an activist in promoting women's health issues and writing about them. And I hadn't had children yet and thought I didn't want to have them. And then Suddenly, I noticed there was something missing in my life, and it's what the English call being feeling broody. And I realized I was, I was, it was time to have kids. The biological clock was ticking. So, fast forward, when I was about forty-eight, I had a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, and that's when I went into these fluctuating mood swings and hot flashes. I was having a mood swing every 20 minutes and a hot flash in between. And and having been a health educator by then for some 10, 15 years, I, I knew I wanted to go the natural route. I, I knew there was something I needed to do that could get a handle on this because it, one day I remember screaming at my kids and looking at them and seeing fear in their eyes and <laughs> thinking, oh my God, my children are afraid of me. So it was time to do something, and I started looking into it, found out there was such a thing as a hormone test, a a simple non-invasive test to measure levels of active hormones and find out, did I have a hormone imbalance? I mean, at that time, the concept of hormone imbalance balance wasn't really all that common. So I started looking into this and ended up getting a test, finding out that I was had all kinds of you know imbalances of estrogen and progesterone, and my cortisol stress hormones were screamingly high. And I started using some natural approaches, and within days, and this doesn't happen with everyone, can take a little longer depending on how much and how long you've been out of balance. But for me, it was within days, the hot flashes cooled, my mood swings were better, and my kids and family were saying that I was so much easier to live with. And I just realized this was a big deal. So I sent an email to Dr. John Lee, who's kind of the guru of the the hormone balance concept. He wrote a famous book called What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Menopause. And he at the time was the guru of natural hormones. He had been a doctor in Mill Valley where they still, in San Francisco area, still have the highest breast cancer rates in the country. And he had been using synthetic hormones on his patients for years until he realized there were bioidentical, normal, natural choices that European women had been using forever. So he wrote this book. I wrote to him and I said, I'm a health educator. I want to learn about this. Please, can I study at your knee? What can I do? And he wrote back and said, well, where you live in Portland, Oregon, there's another hormone guru that I work with, a biochemist who runs a big hormone testing lab. Why don't you call him? So I called Dr. David Zava and within days had a job as the director of education at his hormone testing laboratory in Portland. So I worked, I was there for like 15 years and learned at his knee. He was my mentor. I applied what I knew as a hormone, as a health educator and started specializing in hormones and the, and now I'm doing private consulting because at ZRT, it was, it seemed like we were always talking to providers, not women. And I wanted to talk to women and help them because we're so many of us just bouncing off the walls when the perimenopausal years hit. So that's kind of an encapsulation of how I got to this point where I'm doing private consults with women who need, and I find so many women just need to talk about what's going on with them. 
I absolutely agree. And I've actually been a provider for, I've ordered labs at CRT labs before many times for women over the years. Mm -hmm. And what was your experience working there? What were some of the things that you found? I mean, clearly you're talking to a lot of providers. I'm not sure if you were looking at test results as well, but what were a lot of what you were seeing at, at that laboratory, you know, working for 15 years under this amazing doctor? Kind of what was that experience like? Actually, I started in 2000 there, and that was when the light bulb was just coming on about the concepts of a balance versus imbalance, the fact that you could actually test. We had, I think at that time, 75% of our clients were women who just were smart and knew that something was going on with their hormones and had done some research and were buying test kits and, and getting the results and then finding, hopefully finding someone to work with. But there weren't that many doctors back then that knew about this or believed in it. They thought the standard blood draw was all they would use and they didn't think there was any point in testing hormones. And there are still doctors out there like that. Then in 2003, so I was working with Dr. Zava and bio compounding pharmacists who are all biochemists and they understand how to look at test results and how to consult with doctors about dosage of bioidenticals if needed. You know, hormones are not always needed. I mean, prescribed hormones are not always needed for a while or at all. But, you know, I worked in that milieu for, for years and years with, with uh, and saw probably thousands of test results and learned that, you know, most women into their 40s start to have serious fluctuations of hormones. And we started noticing even younger and younger ages, especially is interesting around when the Twin Towers fell, the stress levels that we saw spiking, cortisol levels being so out of whack in people, you know, just general anxiety. And then there was 2003, the Women's Health Initiative that showed the dangers. Finally, the first long-term random controlled trial of women on synthetic HRT, you know, derived from pregnant mare's urine, the ones that were really suspect, but we've been told were good for us, were now shown to be so risky that they had to stop the study three years early, showing increased heart disease, heart attacks, uh, doubling of blood clots, huge increases in breast cancer, all in tandem with the use of HRT. So then in 2003, there was that sea change, which I'm sure you remember, where doctors were suddenly can't prescribe HRT, but what do we prescribe? We don't know. You know, they were all using, so many doctors were using the one size fits all 0.625 milligrams. Mm -hmm. So they would prescribe the same thing to me, my mother, my sister, the woman down the block, you know, the gal at the grocery store, it was all the same. And we're not all the same. I went through all that huge sea change of, attitudes toward synthetics versus bioidenticals and and then there was the you know the whole thing with Suzanne Summers writing her book Sexy Years she really put bioidentical hormones on the map and things just really started to escalate where many providers probably like yourself started getting trained in this you know learning how to functional medicine doctors integrative medicine doctors the the future of medicine looking at the root cause not just telling women, and I still hear this, but that you're just uh, depressed, you need an antidepressant, or here's an anti-anxiety drug, or you're in menopause, here's HRT, take it forever. I mean, my own mother was on HRT for 30 years without ever being tested until I got into this world, and then I was able to get her reversed and turned around. But you know, that's the kind of thing that was going on for so long. And we're still in a revolution, I think. We're still learning. It's still a learning curve, because Hormones are potent things, and we have to be very judicious in using them appropriately in concert with test results. I absolutely agree. Now, we've been talking a lot about the revolution of women's health and women's hormone health, and it hasn't been that long that we've made no. some major transformations. And we, like you said, we're still in the thick of figuring things out. And as mm -hmm. you mentioned, I have met a lot of doctors who are still running blood tests only, who right. are still trying to recommend synthetic type um, hormones and are really putting women on antidepressants and anti anxieties before uh, pills before anything else. Yeah. And when I was a little girl, I, you know, I was told by my mom, you know, back when my grandma was growing up, that when she was in her 50s, they basically just gave her volume or some type of tranquilizer because back then menopause was hysteria. It was, yes. a, you know, it was practically a diet. Right. 
before hysteria. And I'm so grateful to have having you work in these labs, having you see so many of these tests and being yes. a part of this movement is such a big win for us. So mm-hmm. we, I know we're talking about hormones specifically, but what specific hormones are we really looking at? And specifically, I'd love to know what are these hormones that are the key to women's health and longevity? Because as you and I know, there's a lot of hormones in the body. There's a lot of chemical messengers, but we're really kind of zoning in on a couple of specific hormones here. For women, you know, the master female hormones that we need to ha- get a handle on, which are the ones that really start to do the seesaw, as I said, starting earlier in our late 30s, but should around late 30s to mid 40s, women start to note changes. And generally those changes are in estrogen and progesterone, the two, the two hormones that regulate the, the menstrual cycle. And, you know, estrogen, we want to know how much estrogen we have because it's a growth hormone. So testing estrogen in relation to progesterone, its balancing partner is absolutely essential if you've got all kinds of symptoms. And as we get older, we don't want estrogen growing, growing, growing things without checks and balances, which is what progesterone does. So estrogen is the hormone that, you know, it's been called the angel of life because it grows it, it grew our female organs, the uterus, the breasts. It grows the egg and the ovary every cycle. That, that whole first phase of the menstrual cycle is all about estrogen growing, multiplying, dividing that, the cells of that egg growing in the follicle, growing and thickening the lining of the endometrial uterine lining that we shed each cycle. And then upon ovulation, progesterone is, should be produced. Should um, be, right? Yeah, <laughs> should be produced, Right. And that is an issue I'm finding in so many younger women that they're having, either they've been on the birth control and it's, it's obviously shutting down their ovulation or they are off the birth control, but they were on it for so long that their ovulation hasn't returned, in which case they have very little progesterone on board to actually balance the level of estrogen that is present. And that becomes a problem because there can be, and this is one of the major things we test, estrogen, progesterone, and the ratio between them. Is there enough progesterone on board to balance the growth excitatory activity of estrogen? And if there isn't, and estrogen is dominant, and you've heard that phrase, estrogen dominance, Mm -hmm. which can really be defined as estrogen can actually be low or normal. It doesn't have to actually be high to be dominant because it's a relative thing. If progesterone is low or inadequate because we are not ovulating, either because of the birth control thing or because of prolonged stress or not getting enough protein or not getting enough good fats or getting too into high intensity exercise, all the things that disrupt ovulation in younger women or in older women because they're in menopause and their ovaries have packed up we see in test results often a lack of progesterone relative to estrogen, putting women into estrogen dominance, which means lots of weight gain in the hip size and bottom, water retention, bloating, bad PMS, weight gain, all kinds of mood swings, and even related thyroid problems. So Mm -hmm. estrogen dominance is actually, we see in test results over many years, it's more the problem than estrogen deficiency usually because estrogen is made in fat cells. So we get it there. Estrogen is in the environment. We can talk about xenos all you want, xeno foreign estrogens, toxic estrogens. There are so many ways we get estrogen in the system, but not enough ways to get enough progesterone if we're not ovulating. So that's a big issue that we see in testing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I can't tell you how often I've been tested over the years. I mean, I, you know, being estrogen dominant, then seeing your cortisol levels and saying, aha, like you can see what's happening there. And I really wanted to emphasize one of the things that you said, and a lot of women always seem very confused about this is that you can still have low estrogen and be estrogen dominant. And really it's because of that relationship to from estrogen to progesterone. And as you mentioned before, 
there's a lot of ways for us to bring in estrogen. Now, I would love to tie in specifically something that I'm always, you know, kind of the thing that I always love to be talking about Mm -hmm. is so often the reason why I see low progesterone levels outside of, you know, potential toxic exposure of extra estrogen Mm -hmm. is that cortisol connection. And can you speak a little bit to that cortisol connection that you've probably seen? Because how often have you seen the relationship of estrogen to progesterone be too high and then correlating with that when you're looking at the four the kind of the the daytime into nighttime cortisol levels do you see those out of whack all the time because there's a big connection between progesterone and cortisol and i didn't mention testing also has to include testosterone and dhea but yes. we can talk about that but this is a big issue because the adrenal glands which I know you know this, so I'm t- saying for your listeners, mm-hmm. yeah. the adrenal glands are, you know, they're making the, we always hear about the fight or flight hormone adrenaline. So if you were running from the Taliban or a tsunami, or you had to lift the car off of your cat's tail, you know, you hear these crazy stories, but adrenaline is that fight or flight hormone. Now we're in a state of fight or flight in our heads. You know, we're living from the neck up. We have all this stress from the neck up, good stress, bad stress, whatever it is. The body doesn't know between divorce or donuts. I mean, right. you know, it's, life- it's perceived. Your body thinks you are literally being chased by a tiger yeah. all the time. But you're sitting still and, you're, and you're, you've got unresolved issues in your head and maybe you haven't, you're not sleeping well or maybe you're you know, under pressure at work, whatever. The, like I said, the body, the, the major things, divorce, death, moving across the country, losing your job can also be good stress. Too many weddings, birthdays, Christmas, being overbooked, overcommitted. The body doesn't know the difference. It just has to maintain the cortisol response, which is that 24-7 cortisol level that that the adrenals make every day highest, they should be highest levels in the morning to get us up and going and taking us through the day with a certain good amount of energy so that we don't have a meltdown in traffic or, you know, that we can maintain throughout the day without having to rely on sweets and caffeine to get through the day. And then by night, seeing lower levels at bedtime so that we are calming in the evening and moving towards, you know, sleep and production of melatonin. And that whole, that whole diurnal pattern every day, that production of cortisol depends on a good supply of, guess what, progesterone. Mm -hmm. So what happens is the adrenals start, there's something called the progesterone steel or the pregnenolone steel, which is the mother hormone that makes progesterone. But either way, the adrenals, if they have to meet the demand for those of us with a high octane life, and who doesn't have, I mean, there's an abundance of stress these days. And obviously people are becoming less and less able to relax and shut off and have downtime. We can't even turn off our phones. I mean, we are, you know, the cortisol response is not getting turned off. And so there's this high demand because we're constantly doing, people your age are, you know, we're, we've got kids, we've got full-time careers, even people my age, I'm past menopause now, but I'm, my life is speeding up too because we're all, you know, sharing what we know and there's just so much to do. It's the crazy busy thing which is, you know, everybody's saying, I'm crazy busy, although I don't think that's extremely admirable. I think we need to be crazy unbusy, try to find time. But the point is the adrenals actually have to have progesterone on board as a raw material, the precursor for cortisol production for those levels to follow a normal pattern from highs to lows throughout the course of the day. And so they are stealing what little progesterone we may have, especially if we're not ovulating regularly. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have a period and not ovulate regularly. So here goes a cycle where there wasn't enough progesterone made and the adrenals are stealing what we do have. And that creates more of an estrogen burden. Estrogen, again, is high relative to a lack of progesterone. Does that make sense? 
Oh, absolutely. I was thinking about the question and I loved how you put it because it's perceived stress. And a lot of people are concerned about adrenal fatigue and it's not necessarily adrenal fatigue. They're just taking on the marching orders of, mm-hmm. of our brain, right? Of our, of our, hypo, of our hypothalamus. And what I right. love talking to people about is the HPA axis, the hypothalamic right. pituitary axis and how you really brought it in. And I love the way that you mentioned it is really perceived stress. You get that text message, you're late in your schedule your brain doesn't know the difference between you receiving a text message that throws you off or, or you being in a situation where you've got to lift a car up to save yeah. somebody, right? It's it's, it doesn't reasons. matter. Yeah. Yeah, the HPA axis is always overseeing that and trying to regulate and create a normal, you know, a, it's a survival response, really. I agree. You know. So now that we've got kind of a sense of talking about the estrogen progesterone, and then mind you, you know, one of the other things, and I know we don't have time to talk about thyroid either, but those cortisol marching orders are far greater than even progesterone and estrogen. We're talking about yeah. you know, shifting the way the gut's functioning. We are sending massive messages to the thyroid to boost, like boost metabolism. And you begin to see this array of, of imbalance kind of all over the body, you know, and I, I feel like that's probably what you're seeing. Now, we, I know that the testing also looks at the thyroid panel. Can you, and, and testosterone and DHEA, how does cortisol begin to play a role in some of those hormones? The packages that I have are, I have a jumpstart package which, te- which tests estrogen, progesterone, the ratio between them, DHEA, testosterone four cortisols, and we can add an a la carte thyroid. So looking at TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, free T4, the most abundant thyroid hormone, but relatively inactive, and free T3 and and TPO antibodies for Hashimoto's. And there's an interesting connection between cortisols not working properly or being impaired and thyroid function, because those two work like bivalves. So if you have impaired cortisol function and lack of progesterone with estrogen dominance, what basically starts to happen, I mean, one way to look at it is something we call, and I'm sure you've heard of this and know of it, is functional hypothyroidism, where you know the typical story is someone's gaining weight and can't lose, is in a, in a panic about, I've always had a flat stomach, I never had a weight problem, now I suddenly do, I must, my thyroid must be off. I hear this all the time went to the doctor, got a thyroid test, and it was all fine. Everything was fine. No, no problem with the thyroid. And this actually can be the case that the gland itself is functioning. It's healthy. The thyroid gland is working. It's making the TSH level is stimulating thyroid to produce hormone. It's producing T4. But there's a, there's a roadblock in the conversion of T4 to active thyroid hormone T3 triodothyronine. So that conversion can get hung up because of an imbalance of estrogen, where it is actually acting as a blockade, excess estrogen binding up that active thyroid hormone or stopping that conversion. And also that connection between impaired adrenals, adrenal function and thyroid not being able to convert to active thyroid. So then you start to get symptoms of low thyroid, which are really the effect of that all the way back to that imbalance, either the stress hormone imbalance or the estrogen progesterone imbalance, actually undermining thyroid function, yet the thyroid is fine. So many people, if they find that Dr. John Lee and other practitioners have found if they if they deal with the underlying imbalance first. Like don't start with the thyroid, start with the estrogen progesterone balance, start with the cortisols. Let's mm-hmm. find out what where they're at and get those balanced, get the adrenals balanced, reverse the imbalance of estrogen dominance, and then see if the thyroid doesn't often resolve, which which it often does. And I agree with that 100%. So now that we've kind of got a picture of what I often see myself, literally exactly this particular, this particular woman, I can see her in my mind. And I've been this woman before myself. I mean, these exact labs have been my labs in years past. This is the, the trouble that I got myself into. It was, you know, living this hyper-fueled, high-octane life. Yeah. So what do we begin to do, Candice? This is what you do best. So let's say we've got someone with estrogen dominance. The cortisol is off. Thyroid is showing up okay, but something isn't, con- like they know something isn't right. It right. isn't making sense. Where do we begin 
in this journey? Do you start with cortisol levels first? Do you prefer to get that estrogen progesterone balance back to normal? Where do you like to start? Well, you know, now I, I, I should mention I, I left CRT some a couple of years ago and went out on my own and, and I'm doing this testing and consulting with your hormone balance. And mm-hmm. I use a lab called IU Metrics, which does the same testing. Actually, they're run by the the former lab directors of ZRT. It's a very small world of this expertise. So I use that testing and I like to create, I have a package that I, that I really like, which is the estrogen progesterone, the ratio between DHEA and testosterone levels, which are so linked in to strength and stamina and libido. We need to know those levels too. Even mental cognition is tied in with, Mm -hmm. you know, how well you think, how you concentrate and put words together? Do you walk into a room and wonder why you walked in there? Do you, do you forget what you meant to say? I remember when I was in the throes of this, I could never finish a sentence and my girls would be just looking at me. What mom, what, you know, just being the statement, mom, what's the question? (laughs) Being a total airhead, you know, where putting my keys, all these things that you hear about, but there's such a commonality to that women who are gaining body fat and losing muscle mass. You want to know I hear from women constantly that they're anxious and they have no libido. So we need to know the testosterone DHEA levels too, DHEA being the most abundant hormone in the body, which actually breaks down to estradiol as the most potent of the estrogens and testosterone is a pretty important marker to know. So I start there with the four cortisols. That's my, what we call the jumpstart package. And that covers quite a bit. Uh, that's a lot of information right mm-hmm. there. And if we can start to the first step, I do say that it's important to know your symptoms, you know, the symptoms of hormone imbalance. And I think most women intuitively know something's off when they start gaining weight or now they have belly fat that won't budge. But there are many myriad symptoms of hormone imbalance. I mean, some gals have lived with heavy, painful periods for years. And they just think, well, I have heavy, painful periods. My mother had heavy, painful periods. That's the way it is. No, that doesn't need to be the way it is. That is a common hallmark symptom of estrogen dominance. Mm -hmm. You talk to women who, you know, had to stay home from work or stay home from school or women that gain so much weight over, you know, around their periods or have the worst, you know, pass me the shotgun type of PMS where they want to divorce their husband and they hate their boyfriend and Their children need to stay away or they're unsafe. I mean, this famous woman in England, Dr. Katerina Dalton, actually, who was doing studies on PMS back in the 50s, actually defended a woman who had killed her boyfriend while she was having PMS. And she showed them the physiologic levels of hormones and made the case for this woman. But the basic thing is know the symptoms. Mm-hmm. There are many symptoms of hormone imbalance. You can go to my website, yourhormonebalance.com, and see what those are. I mentioned some of them, but certainly low libido and, and all of those things that I was mentioning, PMS and weight gain in the hips and thighs and belly fat and PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. We see levels of you know high androgen levels of DHEA and testosterone. And these gals can have excess facial hair, irregular periods, acne, and and oily skin, edgy, you know, aggressive feelings all the time, and and even risk for infertility. All of this testing is knowing the symptoms, getting the testing to confirm to what extent your symptoms are there and to what extent your hormones are out of balance. So identifying those imbalances and then using that test result as a guide to rebalancing those major specific imbalances that stick out and rebalancing them naturally because there are many approaches. I know you're into essential oils big time. There are natural bioidentical hormones that are available without prescription that are, you know, sometimes all a woman needs to get back on track. There are foods that we need to know about, phytoestrogens and natural, you know, plant-based eating is a great way to go. There are just many, many natural approaches. So what I do is I assess the hormone results. I talk to women on the phone for a good 50 minutes. If you buy a package with me, and I would like to offer your listeners a discount, you get a 50-minute consult with me so that we go through the results together. And I explain to women, what does estrogen do? What does progesterone do? Why do these imbalances correlate with the symptoms you reported? We, sh- we match it all up 
So people are able to say, oh my God, there's a reason, you know, uh, there's a reason. It, it's such a, a relief to know that actually there usually is a reason for the way you're feeling. And then I send an action plan with all of the best knowledge that we know, what we know is out there that can help to balance hormones naturally. If someone needs a prescription, the, you know, people that do need some, perhaps some, an estrogen patch or some prescribed cortisone, et cetera, I refer them to people like you. So mm -hmm, <laughs> absolutely. And there we go. What has been, because clearly testing is so important. So I'm so grateful we're talking about that. I always say, like Oprah, know your numbers, knowing what's yeah. going on. And then you're right, pairing it with the symptoms. And mm -hmm. so often they're going to find the brain fog, the, the difficult yes. remembering, the mood swings, maybe the PMS rage, the belly fat, all of these things begin to add up. And we start to see a picture, the, the exhaustion in the middle of the day, or maybe yes. they're exhausted in the morning. So you know, common. So Waking common. up in the middle of the night, calling mm -hmm. your friend at 3 a.m. because she's awake too. Right. <laughs> exactly. The, the chocolate craving that just doesn't go away. Yep. These yep. persistent. And so, you know, it's so refreshing to hear specifically that you're kind of looking at, looking at the whole picture because clearly functional medicine is where we want to focus our efforts. And food is such a major player for me when it comes to the estrogen progesterone connection. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. cortisol, I find, is really about changing their lifestyle. And so have there been yes. some like key tips, some key areas where you've seen women really move the needle? Is it meditation that you recommend? Is it yoga? Is it looking at how they're exercising? Because let's be honest, when we're, when we're putting on that weight and it isn't moving, you know, so many of these driven women, we're willing to work out two hours a day to drop this weight and yet the scale doesn't move. So, well, you know, interestingly, there are several things on that front. Women whose adrenals are actually down let's say the morning level is low when it should be high mm -hmm. and the nighttime level is high when it should be low or it's an erratic pattern because you know that pattern should be, as I said, high in the morning, dropping gradually to mm -hmm. the lowest point at night so we can sleep. And you see spikes and dips and all kinds of uh, patterns and people will look at that and say, wow, that's the story of my life. I'm mm -hmm. dragging out of bed in the morning. I can hardly get up and then I'm wired at night and mm -hmm. ready to run a marathon. And during the day, I can't keep my eyes open and I have to have caffeine and sweets. I mean, that's the worst scenario, but it's pretty darn common. So the woman who has the belly fat and is absolutely frustrated because she does work out two hours a day and it won't budge is generally the woman that has erratic or flattened cortisol profiles. And the remedy there is got to dial back on that intense exercise. Mm -hmm. Because what's happening is that intense exercise, and I, I can't tell you how many women I've talked to that are over-exercising. We know that marathon runners and Olympic athletes are famous for having anovulatory cycles, but they don't ovulate. So again, back to that lack of progesterone, no food for the adrenals to make cortisol, we got to dial back on the intense exercise. And instead of five days of spinning, maybe two days of spinning and a day in there of walking, swimming, Pilates, yoga, something that releases tension from the muscles. So putting a nice sort of mixed approach to exercise into your week, a little weightlifting if your testosterone and DHEA are low because you've got to build up that lean muscle, but not weightlifting every day, maybe a couple days a week and working with someone that can help you. Maybe it's light weights and more reps or heavier weights and fewer reps, whatever it is. It's all important, but it can't be this high intensity workout all the time because it's just flogging the adrenals. So that is a huge thing, especially when the adrenals are already looking, you know, kind of tired or taxed or overworked and they're not keeping up. And you can see that clearly in that cortisol pattern. Another big issue with cortisols and weight gain is the nighttime cortisol if it is high, in particular nighttime cortisol, or even a flattened profile where it's high all the time, you get this thing where you have an interaction with appetite hormones, which work on the same sleep-wake cycle that as uh, you know, the cortisol melatonin sleep-wake cycle is also intertwined with the appetite hormones that are working on that same cycle. So women who have high cortisol at night, let's say, and it's exacerbated by they're on their cell phone in their bed 
or they're mm-hmm. watching television mm-hmm. or on their they're on their computer and the blue light is completely disrupting melatonin production. Now, a lot of people know that, but a lot of people don't know that. So they're not sleeping, their cortisol is high, and now their appetite hormones are becoming completely reversed. So leptin, the hormone that tells you that you're full, you know, the satiety hormone that says, hey, you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're not hungry, plummets and the hunger hormone ghrelin increases. And this is a very direct connection with with disrupted sleep, being on your iPhone, your laptop, all of that, whatever disrupts sleep and raises cortisol levels at night can absolutely affect your weight because now you're hungrier, you tend to overeat, you're almost hardwired to overeat because the body wants you to eat. It's trying to fuel you. The brain is trying to fuel you and so it's creating a hunger response because it's a survival thing, not sleeping, cortisol's off, incomplete production of melatonin. It's a vicious cycle. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I said a lot in there, but it, you know, it has to do with habits like the addiction to our electronic gizmos at night. And it has to do with what are we eating at night before, you know, late at night, are we drinking a lot of wine and having foods that may cause a hypoglycemic blood sugar drop in the middle of the night that is a stress response. Cortisol goes up in the middle of the night and we're wide awake. There are so many reasons. Absolutely. There, no, and I absolutely agree with you there, Candace. There are so many reasons. And just kind of taking a look at this and seeing what's going on. But I feel like, as you mentioned before, so much of what's driving our cortisol levels is definitely habits and, you know, and, and really getting more clear around those habits mm-hmm. and around that self-awareness. I think that is so, so key. Now, we are kind of finishing up, and I'm going to share a little bit about what you're offering. I know you've mentioned it a couple times, but is there any last words you want to mention to our ladies here? Because a lot of these ladies are, you know, most of my audience are in perimenopause and menopause, not that I yeah. don't have women a little bit younger. And for me, I started feeling the shift of peri- into perimenopause, or at least hormones began to shift for me at 35. That's when yeah. I was like, whoa, 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 what's mm-hmm. going on here? I'm not rebounding like I used to. Right. And I had to become even more aware. So anything you can add to this particular group of women, which I feel maybe is the group of women that you serve as well? Well, one of the things, you know, is you've been emphasizing throughout the conversation, this concern with cortisol levels being off. And that really is a major area to, to address because they do tend to take over when stress takes center stage and cortisol levels are off, everything else is at risk. All the other hormones are out of balance. So it's really important to have that measurement. And saliva testing, of course, is the gold standard Mm -hmm. for measuring cortisol because it's non-invasive. You don't want to stick yourself with a needle and then cause further stress and skew test results. So just on the cortisol front, look at your life and say, so when's the last time? Make a list of the 10 things you love to do most. That's easy. But then you go back through that list and check off, when is the last time I went camping or scrapbooking or went to the theater or went on a trip or took a break or or had you know a morning to myself? What are the things that we love to do that relax us and calm us and bring us joy? And when are the last times we did those things? That's a real wake-up call. And from that, you can say, okay, probably have some adrenal fatigue or some cortisol issues going on, which probably are linked to all these other symptoms that I have. And there are so many lifestyle approaches like the meditation and the yoga, different things you mentioned, making boundaries around your yourself saying, hey, this is for my health. I need you know, a half an hour to myself in the morning before I go to work, or I have to have Saturday afternoons camping or whatever it is that we need to do for ourselves. Women are notorious at taking care of everybody else but themselves. And I would say that is the message. If you are feeling off, tired, depressed, irritable, nervous, you know, so many, how many women are on antidepressants and will tell you they like their life and they don't know why they're depressed. So what I'd like to do is offer just a 10% discount on the jumpstart kit, or we also have a weight management kit that adds on a vitamin D, which is very crucial to weight gain. And we have an extra 50 minute consult that we offer with a nutritional health coach, an IIN nutritional health coach. So 
We have a weight management package and a jumpstart package, and we can offer 20% off with your Dr. Maritza as a promo code to put into when you order a kit. And I would say, please go to my website first and check them out and learn more before you do that. But I'm ready to talk hormones with anybody that wants to talk hormones. I feel like it's, it's talk therapy begins first. Let's talk about what's been going on with you, even back to the last two years. Because, you know, stress hormones, if, if you've had a major stressor over the last two years, your adrenals can still be depleted and not working for you. And there goes, you know, the rest of that beautiful synchronized balance that we're hoping to get. So that's, that's what I would say as my, as my last little wrap up to your listeners. Thank you so much, Candice. And thank you so much for sharing the offer. One, I was about to mention it myself, so you're right on it. And where you're going to find that, where you're going to find that link is inside of the show notes. You're just going to go onto this episode, grab the link, or Candice Honey, they can find you at yourhormonebalance.com. Right. And she is also on Instagram where I found her at Your Hormone Balance or on Facebook, which is Your Hormone Balance. So really easy to find Candace. Candace, thank you so much. Girl, you said all the things I was hoping you would say because it's so, you it's know, a lot to cover. <laughs> it is a lot to cover. You did such a marvelous, mar- you did such a marvelous job mm-hmm. at really mm-hmm. conveying that information. So please go check out Candice if you're looking for more. You know, these are topics that I'm covering all the time on the Essentially You podcast in particular. And I just want to say again, thank you so much, Candice. Your, your information was invaluable today. Well, it was my pleasure. Thanks again for, for having the conversation with me. We are, we're all learning, so we're, it's our job to share it with people. That's the mission, to share what we know and get you feeling better. And you can feel better. I don't think many women realize how much better they could be feeling. So it's very doable. Thank you so much, Candice. Thank you for your message. You're welcome. Take care. I really appreciated Candice's insight and expertise on testing for hormone fluctuations and hormonal imbalances. It's so important that, like Oprah always says, know your numbers so that we can make educated decisions about our bodies. I also appreciate the validity that hormones play in the body. And what I mean by that is that Candace brings that level of validity, right? That we talk about hormones playing massive roles in the body, our emotional well-being, our physical well-being, our longevity, helping to protect us against cancers, particularly hormone-driven cancers. You know, hormones are so much a part of who we are as women. And the great thing about that is that we really do control so much of it especially during perimenopause and beyond, even though it may not feel that way. You know, probably the number one question I'm getting from women about my new book is, can it help me if I am in perimenopause or can it help me if I am menopause and beyond? And I want you to know that 100% it can. I wrote my book for you. As a woman in perimenopause and having a mom that I love and adore, who, by the way, the book was dedicated to, in postmenopause, this transition in our bodies deserves to be addressed, and you can feel confident that the book will do that and serve you. Now, if you are really interested in diving very deep with Candace, she has a wonderful offer that you can take advantage of. Candace is offering 20% off of all hormone test kits and consultation packages to the Essentially You listeners with the code capital letters Dr. Marisa. And you can grab it in the show notes um, or you can contact her at info at yourhormonebalance.com for more information. Now, as you know, the links are going to be in the show notes. They'll also be on my website, which is drmarisa.com slash episode 70. So drmarisa.com episode 70. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on today and listening in to the Essentially You podcast. You are such an inspiration for this podcast, especially episodes like this, and there will be more and more of these to come. Coming up, I am bringing on, so for this next episode later on this week, I am bringing on my dear friend, Andrea Nakayama. She is one of the pioneers in functional nutrition and has trained thousands of doctors and coaches on functional medicine. And we're going to be talking about why functional medicine and functional nutrition matter to you. I want to shed light on functional medicine and what it's going to be bringing to the horizon of healthcare. And Andrea 
is one of the best people to be able to interview and get more insight into what what the future holds when it comes to functional medicine and how that plays a major role for you. So I look forward to seeing you on the next episode and I can't wait to shed some light on this beautiful topic. Until then, have an amazing week. Bye.